Robert Siciliano is a best-selling author of five books. In the 90s, he appeared on the Montel Williams show posing as a water company worker, conning his way into unsuspecting homeowner residences. Then he inappropriately used a stun gun on the Howard Stern show. Recently, he appeared on Dr. Oz, where he successfully fished Dr. Oz employees, then brought a hacked ATM on Anderson Cooper's show, exposing thousands of credit and debit cards. Recently on CNN, he stabbed a melon in the eye in response to a murdered college-aged woman to demonstrate rideshare safety. He has presented over a thousand security awareness training events as the architect of the CSI Protection Certification and Designation, a cyber social and identity protection security awareness training program. He also coined the phrase, security is good for you, just like broccoli. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So Robert uh, Siciliano, right? Is that how you pronounce it? I tried my best Italian uh, pronunciation. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to host you for the uh, you know for the weekly uh, New York Information Security Meetup uh, slash uh, Cyber Guild event. And uh, you know I I looked into your background and and it's really truly remarkable. You've done so much. Um, you know uh, just some of the stuff from from uh, you know from the Wikipedia page. Um, you basically showed up on every major news uh, broadcast, CNN, Anderson Cooper, MSNBC, Fox News, CNBC, Inside Edition, Today Show. It's 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 amazing. Forbes, uh, Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, I guess it's like the, the magazines, the New York Times, uh, Los Angeles Times, Washington Times. Chicago. How does this, somebody... Um, I mean, you've built like a major brand for yourself. I mean, in this, you know, the cyberspace, um, you know, so, so maybe you can kind of walk me like through, you know, inception, like, you know, how, how you started. Um, I think you were doing some private investigation or like you're doing some, some, you know, physical security stuff. And then you kind of venture into the, into the cyberspace. So why don't we kind of walk us through, you know, like maybe like, you know, high school, uh, graduation and then what happens then? How do you, how did you kind of advance from there? Do you really want to go back that far? <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit. Like, I mean, you've, you've accomplished a lot. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Like I said, I think, uh, I think some people, even some of the young, young folks today, I, I, I tell them that people that are trying to get into cybersecurity, I say, hey, you know, what you should do is you should market yourself. You should build some, some brand, you know, write, start writing some writing blogs, some, you know, post some, some stuff on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, but you're the king of that. You've managed to really establish a, a major presence online and offline. Um, so yeah, you walk us kind of through through that process. That'd be great. Sure, I'll try to make it as uh, condensed as possible. So uh, I uh, didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up out of high school, and um, my dad was a, a union pipe fitter. And so when I was about to graduate, I said, "Dad, what am I going to do when I get out of high school?" He said, "You're going to be a pipe fitter." I'm like, "What the hell's a pipe fitter?" He's like, "It's what I do, you know, HVAC." I'm like, "Okay, I'll be a pipe fitter." <laughs> And so I um, went to trade school, went to union school, and I spent my first five years as an apprentice uh, making my father miserable because I didn't want to be there and, um, you know, serving under him. And all the while, I had been building a business revolving around personal security as it relates to violence and theft prevention in the physical world. So this is in the late 80s, early 90s. So my passion was teaching people security awareness training, women, personal protection, uh, rape prevention, due to I had met a lot of young women in my teens that had been sexually assaulted. I myself was a victim of a multiple attack situation at the age of 12 in downtown Boston, and it kind of woke me up to bad guys. Right, so in downtown Boston back in, what was this, the 90s? It was a very yeah. different place than there is today, right? Early 80s, yeah. yeah early 80s, yep. um, and so walking the streets of Boston, co the combat zone in Boston was where we hung out as kids. And, uh, you know, it's prostitutes and adult bookstores and just a lot of nasty people. And so, um, you know, I, I got into a, this multiple attack situation with my little brother. And my dad pulls us aside and he explained predators and their prey by making us watch, like, the Mutual of Omaha's Wild World of Animals on PBS. And... Um, <laughs> And, he, and I understood the lion being the predator and the gazelle being the prey. And my dad would say, you're the gazelle. 
And, and it woke me up to not everybody's as nice as mommy and daddy. And so over the years, as a victim of that multiple attack situation and being concerned for you know women's personal security uh, and hearing of other all, all these women being raped, it it set the tone for the direction of my focus and for my life. And so I started this business on personal security, doing seminars like Tupperware parties on safety for women, selling pepper sprays and stun guns back in the late 80s and early 90s. And then around 94, 95, I was online. Like I had a website before anybody that I knew had a website so early that um, I was online early enough that I owned LedZeppelin.com. That's how long I've been online for. And that didn't go over well, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I was about to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that later. So um, in 1995, I had the ability, I had an online uh, ordering and I had a, a, a mail order catalog as well. And I had merchant status. So getting merchant status was not easy to do back in the mid 90s because there was a lot of fraud, which I didn't quite understand. But within a week of having the ability to accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express, I got hacked in the mid-90s. Thousands of dollars in credit card fraud, and I lost all of that. And as a very small business, this is just me. Uh, I was devastated. Like I lost a lot of money, a lot of product. I had paid all that money back to the merchants, to, to Visa, MasterCard, American Express. And as upset as I was, I was fascinated by how they did it. I, I was like, I reverse engineered their process and I saw how they did it. And I actually found a lot of people that did what they did to me. But more so, I realized that this is going to be the biggest thing ever. Like if they could do this to me, they could do this to anybody. And, and I saw what internet fraud was before internet fraud was internet fraud. You know, this is before even Kevin Mitnick was hacking the Pentagon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I was being victimized as a small business. And so... Uh, I started to follow that. You know, there are very few nonprofits in the country that were talking about identity theft and privacy. Like, it just wasn't a thing yet. And then the Identity Theft Deterrence Act of 1998 was passed, and all of a sudden, it was real. So I started to write about it. You know, I didn't have much of a blog, but I had written a book on personal security in 95. And when you're an author, that establishes you as an expert, or it, it's, it's one of the things that establishes you as an expert. And right off the bat, like I got on the Montel Williams show, the Sally Jesse Raphael show. There's a, a guy named Gordon Elliott. I got on the Howard Stern show. So I started doing all these you know, local, regional, and national talk shows and TV shows back in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. And um, that, is, that established my base as a, as a source for journalists. Uh, both print and online and television uh, early on. And like like business begets business, PR begets PR. And part of you know your ability to do PR means you have to speak you know pithy sound bites. And I say all the time, this might sound odd to people, but I am the only person that I know that has spoken to every major media naked, naked. Because I answer the phone in the shower, which matters. Because when the media calls, if you don't answer the phone, they're calling somebody else immediately. Mm -hmm. So I secured a tremendous amount of media because they answer the phone immediately. Did you uh, turn the water off or you still have it on when it's when it's yeah. a call? Or you have like a, a noise-canceling headset? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Suds open all, turn it off. And, and I'm immediately responding to a media query. And with the media, they either want to comment right there and then or they want to book you for TV within a couple of hours. For breaking news so that all occurred in the mid 90s and by 2001 my small business was doing okay i was still a pipe fitter at the time and then 9 11 hit and so when 9 11 hit i had already established myself as a voice in the industry as a source for media for journalists uh as a as a as a, as a speaker as a trainer mm -hmm. and 9 11 hit what i was saying for at this point probably eight years mattered uh, people wanted to hear more and so uh, i basically quit my job and went full-time and immediately you know began to make a living uh speaking full-time and um here we are today like identity theft back then was the easiest crime to commit and the hardest crime to get caught for and it still is. Mm -hmm. Now we have organized web mobs, and here we are.
Right. So you've seen the industry really change and, and not even that, like, you know, September 11 was a milestone. Uh, I think COVID-19 is a milestone, right? Um, you know, the, the, each one had its own um, kind of a pivot structure for, you know, how people perceive cybersecurity, both both on the corporate side as well as individually. Um, so tell me about what the kind of the highlights of, of um you know your message because you're very obviously you're very passionate uh, about the industry and you're passionate about helping people, individuals, but and companies as well. So, for example, I I noticed you came out with a kind of list of things that companies can do to protect themselves, right? Um, you know, maybe we can kind of jump right into some some current events if you've seen right now. Um, you know, like the kind of the phishing scams, the work from home scams um, that are happening right now through uh, you know through the situation. And potentially, what do you recommend for companies to, to do, um, you know, which also I'm assuming also include like, you know, cybersecurity awareness training and so on? Yeah. So, you know, in all the years that I've been doing this, what has what has um, changed and what not what's not changed is obviously there are so many resources for small, medium, large businesses to shore up their networks, you know, uh, manage security service providers, phishing simulation training. I mean, there's, there's so much, virtual CISOs, in-house IT people, uh, you know, the, the, anything and everything that you need as an organization to protect your networks is there for you. It's just a matter of making that investment. It's just knowing what those, what your options are and making those investments. And the problem is, is that security still isn't embraced as it should be. You know, as a, as a as a society, as a culture, uh, as a species for that matter, we don't look at security as a necessity. We look at it as a pain in the ass, as, a, as, a, as an investment we'd rather not make. And because of that, uh, our focus isn't there. And, you know, you might have heard somewhere along the lines, we become what we think about, right? Well, if you don't think about security, you're not going to be secure. Uh, if you think about McDonald's all day, you're going to get fat and heart disease. So we become what we think about. And security just isn't high on our list of priorities. And it begins with the individual. It begins not necessarily with the employee. It begins with the CEO. It begins with the company officers. And if those company officers, like the ones at Equifax, don't care or don't necessarily do their job effectively or security isn't a priority for them, then it's a matter of time until they're breached. And we see that across the board with, with corporations, small, medium, and large. If the, if the CEO's password is princess or password one, and he's using or she's using that same password across multiple accounts, by, uh, by, a, 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 by example, everybody in the company is going to fail. Uh, the, the company will eventually get breached because that CEO just doesn't care. And that CEO ultimately is a, is a NASCAR dad or a security dad who may not necessarily be thinking in terms of security and just be thinking about racing cars and soccer and this and that or football or bear. And, and, and unless your head is wrapped around the fundamental principles of what security is and isn't, like it's not paranoia. You know, it is something that will happen to you if you have your guard down. It does require uh, diligence and it requires a bit of focus like all the time. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin once said that to be safe is never to be secure. I live by that. And, and that does not mean that I live in paranoia. It does not mean that that you it, it, what it basically means is you always 20 security is 24, 7, 365 always. And the moment that you drop your guard, the moment that you stop thinking securely, that's when the bad guy gets you. And most people are simply sitting ducks and they just don't think it's going to happen to them and they don't want to believe it's going to happen to them and they function in a state of denial. And it's that denial that makes it really easy for the bad guys to do their job. I, I thought that um, there was more awareness now. Like I thought at the, as you mentioned, at the board level, you know, in the past several years, it looks like that, uh, you know, the CISO now is starting to report to the CEOs. And it seems like there is, you know, movement towards being more aware and more cognizant about, you know, the security controls and so on. Uh, in your opinion, it has it's not enough or, or why haven't we seen like a major change in the security stance? And we keep seeing, 
you know, these security breaches happen on a daily basis. It's almost now, it's, it's almost old news, right? You know, a few more millions breach, you know, like uh, accounts got breached and it, it's like, it's it's no more news anymore because it happens so frequently. Back in, in, in the early 2000s, 2004 and five, it would make national news when a university in California had 600,000 records compromised. It would make national news when Choice Point, an information broker, was breached and 250,000 records were compromised because they let uh, Nigerians in the back door, mm -hmm. or actually in the front door for that matter, and, and they lied about it. And there wasn't data breach notification laws from state to state at that time. Only California had that requirement. And so it, it and then there was the target breach, right? Uh, you know, TJX. And so, so it was breaches like that that began to uh, gain attention and then companies providing all the various products and services to protect those networks. And then the companies providing security awareness training began to do a really good job of penetrating the Fortune 1000, the Fortune 500 and so forth. So there is a lot being done, but there isn't enough being done due to the fact that like I think like 60% of small businesses haven't even don't even provide any form of security training awareness uh, awareness training at all or phishing simulation training for that matter. Mm -hmm. It's really only like the major corporations like the UPSs of the world and, and and so forth that have millions of dollars to spend on infosec and on the training that's necessary whereas the the rest of them they just don't think that they're a big enough target for that type of fraud but they are. And it usually, it, it, think of it like this, most home security systems are installed when the, after the house is broken into. That's most people's general um, mindset when it comes to security is like when something bad happens, that's when they do something about it. And you've heard a thousand times, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. When it comes to cybersecurity, if you fail to plan, you plan to pay. And you're paying lawyers, the government, hackers and ransomware um that is going to continue to to get worse until uh all of these smaller businesses begin to shore up because they are the low-hanging fruit right now Look at, only like 25 percent of the public or less uses a password manager when you think about that 75 percent of the of the digital public does not use a password manager and as long as we have passwords you're going to need a password manager how otherwise you can't. You you would have to have the same password across all of your accounts in order to remember them. How otherwise would you function? Using well, a file and a word yeah, they, they reuse the same password, make some changes, very minor, you know, minor changes to the password. So, um, you, you know, this is an interesting question, but Josh uh, says, how do security pros cross the those business lines to create or build upon a company uh, culture of security? What are some practical approaches to get this done internally? You know, how do you advocate for that internally? I love that question. And and that really begins with, uh, so we are a selfish, self-interested, selfish creature. We have to be. Like being selfish is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, in order for you to function, you got to get some sleep. You got to eat properly. You know, you got to take care of yourself. And that means you have to be selfish. You have to take care of yourself. You get all grumpy if you don't sleep. You get all grumpy and, and, if you, and sick if you don't eat. So you, f fundamentally, you got to take care of yourself. And, and security-wise, fundamentally, you have to take care of yourself. And I think that all corporate security begins with the individual and their person and their personal security. So I think that the way to get the dollars for your budgets to invest in security is by making it personal to the people who uh, are responsible for those budgets. And the first question you ask is, do you lock your doors? Okay, good. Do you have a home security system? Well, why don't you have a home security system? Well, because I live in a safe neighborhood. Really? So find that that person's address, find their police blotter, and find all the burglaries and find all the home invasions in and around where they live. And show them you're really not in a safe neighborhood. You might be in a safer neighborhood, but your understanding of what safe is and safe isn't is wrong. Because in baseball, you either are out or you are safe. Safe is an absolute. And most people live under the illusion that they are safe. And they're really not. They are, they just haven't been chosen yet. You know, so when and when you begin to make security more personal to them and their family and their lifestyles, they begin to understand more about the bigger picture. Ask them questions like, do you have identity theft protection? 
Well, did you know that like 17 million people are affected by identity theft every single year? Do you have something called a credit freeze, right? A credit freeze locks down your identity and prevents new account fraud. If you don't have identity theft protection, if you don't have a home security system, if you don't have a credit freeze, then you really aren't even qualified to be making decisions on my budget as a security professional because you know nothing about it. You know, uh, ha have you had the uncomfortable conversations with your family about sexual assault, both with your sons and your daughters? You know, these, th this is an uncomfortable conversation you and I are having right now that I'm suggesting that, that your audience have with the decision makers, because that's the reality of this. You know, if, if they don't have these uncomfortable conversations that I have with my audiences all day, every day, I get in front of my audiences like this and have uncomfortable conversations about the reality of what's going on out there. I, I'll, I'll pull up a, the, the Sex Offender Locator app in the, in the zip code that I'm in, where I'm speaking, and I'll show on the screen all the little red dots of all the sex offenders that live all around the hotel in the convention center, hundreds to thousands of them. There are 859,000 registered sex offenders in the US. That's predators all around us. Just understanding how security is personally, right? We begin to see the bigger picture. And that security isn't about paranoia. Most people, when they talk about, well, I don't want a home security system because I don't want to be, I don't want to live like that. What mm -hmm. the hell does that even mean? <laughs> to most people, that means I don't want to lock my doors because I don't want to live in fear. Really? So you think that security is about fear. Is that what you think? Now, when you put your seatbelt on, are you in fear or are you being smart? You're being smart. Well, so people don't understand that security is about taking control. A seatbelt is about taking control. It's about giving you control of the vehicle. So if a deer does run out in front of you, right, and you start to swerve, you're stuck in that seat really tight. You can hold on to that steering wheel and your feet are right at the gas and you're not rolling into the passenger seat. So when you begin to explain security as a benefit, as a plus, as it's good for you, like broccoli, then you have a much better chance of selling them on the budget. But it takes a, a real deep understanding of the human psyche and how we reject security as being paranoia and fear, especially in the U.S. culture. Now, I understand that you, from abroad, you're from, you spent what, half your life in Israel, right? Yeah, in Israel, Canada, yep. Okay, well, the Israelis, they know about security. So you are under no illusion as to risks that you face every single day. So I'm guessing that you are in tune with everything that I'm saying here and have all those various systems in place, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's part of the culture. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. And I, yeah. Love, I, I love the, uh, you know, I think that this, I can make a t-shirt for the group, you know, security is good for you, like broccoli. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Look, at you. when you see all those people in the swimming pool drinking uh, with pee all around them and there's COVID floating in the air, those people do not care about security right? They are in denial that there is a virus out there that's killing people. And they think, well, it's not going to happen to me. I am perfectly fine. And that unknown, unseen enemy, it will kill people. And it, it is killing people. And people are functioning in a, a form of denial when they're out and about thinking that, well, I'm young, I'm strong, I'm not worried about it. It's not going to happen to me. These bad guys are on every corner. The internet's a bad neighborhood. And unless you fundamentally understand security at its, at its granular level, uh, you can't possibly communicate it in regards to getting it for your budget. Right. So interesting. So what you're saying is that security has to be at the core foundation of individuals that are combining the company. And it has to be a kind of mantra for everyone who is in the company, not just from the CEO all the way down to you know, the employee and people that are, you know, receptionists, whatever else it's, 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 it has to be in the core um, culture of the company, I think. And, and, and you're right. I think it's, you can't distinguish physical security from, you know, from cybersecurity. It's all, you know, it's all security, right. And same, same goes for, you know, health, right. The same, it's, it's all, it's about the same, same concept. So tell me about it. You, you touch upon a really interesting um, comment. You made an interesting comment about uh, the fact SMBs, uh, you know, seems to not think that they're going to get hacked, that they're not a target. What do you think that is? Why Why is that they, they feel that they're, because they do have assets, they, you know, they do have, and, and it, I've seen cases where 
you know, a small factory making tires for 25 years got hacked because they were, you know, it was nation state. They were looking specifically at the process of how they, you know, perfected the manufacturing of tires. And that because we're a knowledge based economy and they were hacked eventually and, and that that knowledge got stolen, you know, despite the fact they were, you know, essentially a low tech company, a very small one. Yeah, it is fundamentally because the people that were uh, in charge of the organization, those that were uh, responsible for the creation and the invention of those ideas and the run and the operation of the company that security was just not something that was of interest to them. Like they just wanted to build out their business and make some money and get paid and, and provide value to the, the marketplace. And security is, is an afterthought. Look, at, if security is an afterthought in the building out of a software or, or of an application, what happens to that software and that application once, once it's deployed? It gets hacked. You know, there are holes the, the size of the, you know, London town of the, 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 you know, the, the it's, it's vulnerable, right? You, you cannot build out an operating system or a software program without engaging it in the application security process from the very beginning. And it's the same thing with a business. And today, you we all have the ability to bring in professionals that know about what, their, what that organization's options are uh, in regards to managed security service providers that can look at the bigger picture. And you might be spending a grand, three grand, five grand, 10 grand, a month, a quarter, a year, depending on the size and scope of your organization and what needs protecting. That is an investment a lot of organizations do not think or want to spend, and they will find reasons to justify that they are not a target based on whatever. Mm -hmm. And you also raised the really interesting, um, you know, uh, descriptive of like, you know, car security they, where they you know, said, okay, you know, you have to wear a seatbelt. What what your thoughts are on compliance and and you know like the the cars were going sixty miles an hour way before they were mandated to wear seatbelts in the car. People died because they were thrown out of vehicles, uh, and then the government said, okay, you know you have to have a seatbelt in the car. You know, starting from this year. So, what's your thought about putting together some sort of regulatory and uh, and I think there is already a regulatory environment where it forces organizations to comply. I know New York State has some. Uh, you know, Mass has some. I mean. It, What's your thoughts about, you know, forcing these organizations to really put, you know, put security in place? So they, there, there is, there, there, there are a number of regulations, both uh, uh, state and federal throughout the country. Uh, of course, you know, there's data breach notification laws, but that's just, you know, one level. Um, you know, having those existing systems in place, Massachusetts, New York, California, they all have uh, lots of strict rules and regs in the books. California usually... Uh, does the best and it rolls out from the West Coast to the East Coast. But, you know, again, New York has done a fabulous job and so has Massachusetts. That being said, the only time it's ever actually enforced is when there's a problem. So there's no reporting mechanism uh, currently in place to show that you actually have a level of security required to make sure that uh, other than if you accept credit cards, uh, then, you know, you have to have some type of a remote access to make sure that your system's up to snuff in order to maintain merchant status. Other than that, um, that and that's all self-regulated. Uh, that being said, uh, getting back to the seatbelts, you know, the seatbelts have been around since the 50s. The seatbelts have been required to be installed in U.S. vehicles since 1968. My dad cut the seatbelt out of our cars in the mid-70s because he didn't want them and need them. He's like, what do you need these things for? <laughs> In the United States, we we not all states require that you wear seatbelts. I think only 24 states require by law that you wear seatbelts. And the other 23, um, I think that they will only fine you if they pull you over for another, uh, another moving violation, right? And there's one state in the country that you don't have to wear a seatbelt at all, and that is New Hampshire. And New Hampshire's motto on their license plate is live free or die, okay? So this, the seatbelt law, most people have only started to click it over the past maybe 10, maybe 15 years because they've been forced to because of the laws. And, and, it, and it's really only because of regulation uh, when you clamp down on an organization or an individual in this case that makes them accountable when there is a breach or when there is some form of vulnerability. 
but I don't think that the pain of being accountable uh, has matched up to the to how vulnerable it's made our citizens. I think there's like 30 to 40 billion records currently in the hands of companies. Oh, it's amazing. You go to a uh, heaven been pond, and I personally have been, you know, my, my email address has been, you know, in numerous breaches. It's, it's got to be like 20 to 25. Um, it's remarkable. So what would it take, and when you say pain, I'm assuming that that will translate to fines. I mean, that's typically what we're looking at. Uh, what do you think will cause, you know, a painful, you know, results? And, and I mean, they're already spending, it looks like some organization, and it's a good question here by a theme. It says security professionals and the leadership do not take security seriously, uh, as you're suggesting, or the system and the tools are not designed to work properly to enable uh, turnkey solutions. It says many millions are spe spent on software and appliances consultants, uh, but the result is largely the same, you know, like in terms of, of these breaches happening. It seems like they're, despite the the at least for the for the larger um you know larger organizations they do spend some some serious money on, on security yeah look at there's no the, the, there's no such thing as 100 percent security there's no perfect security uh there's always going to be vulnerabilities out there but the low-hanging fruit are those organizations that don't necessarily have those systems in place to constantly monitor their networks for uh, anything going in and out of their ports, any traffic that uh, is, you know that they detect that is an anomaly. Uh, there's there's a, there's, a, there's a lot that isn't being done that could be done, and it's all those organizations that are that low hanging fruit that don't have those MSSPs uh, deployed to penetrate their networks, to look for those vulnerabilities, to make sure that all of their hardware and software is properly up to date. I mean, heck, we still have. In this country, there's ATMs using uh, Windows XP, right? So, you know, when 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 an organization looks at uh, all of the, their security holistically, from the top down and the bottom up, uh, penetrating it from the inside and from the outside, legacy systems, uh, they have when they take a holistic approach, they have a much better chance of thwarting fraud. Look at Wells Fargo. I spends like. I think it's like a hundred million dollars a month, like this ridiculous amount of money on security every single month, you know, but it's not your Wells Fargo that's going to be breached. It's, 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 you know, Harry homeowner sitting in front of his device that has the same password across 37 different accounts that his information is already out there and on paste bin and the hacker just logs into his email and just changes his, Wells Fargo passcode, and he's already inside of his email, so he's there to receive that change of password request. Uh, it, it's stuff like that, and, and, and two-factor authentication should be deployed across every single critical account. Of course, it is on banks, but it's it's not widely deployed enough. As far as the grandmother test goes at this point, uh, everybody needs to be up to snuff on the most basic level of security. And if all you're using is a username and a password to access critical accounts, you are not secure. You are vulnerable. You are running naked in the woods, and eventually you're going to get pricked. And it's just a matter of time until you're breached. Right. Uh, and and we we see now that the move, the rapid move to a digital transformation due to the, to the COVID nineteen uh, create like even additional uh, entry points to most organizations. What um, what have you seen that, I'm assuming that there's, you've seen a lot of companies scrambling to to provide, you know, VPN access to employees and, and allow them to work remote, like, you know, almost overnight. Um, you know, uh, in terms of recommendation, what would you recommend for companies, that, like even SMBs and medium-sized businesses, you know, what are the kind of the, the low-hanging fruit that they can kind of take the steps to to secure their, their uh, you know, perimeter or... There is no perimeter, right? It's all zero trust, right? So it's so like people are logging in from their home machines um, and the kids can be playing, uh, you know, online games on the same the same laptop, this work laptop. This is something that's happening all the time. Yeah. Um, so what would you recommend for, for these companies to, to, uh, to do? Well, at a minimum, of course, MDM, you know, mobile device management, uh, you know, whatever um, devices that that uh, employee is using off site, uh, need to be in somewhat control uh, by the by the organization, and that means su such control that it eliminates the ability, it, it eliminates administrative access to be able to even install anything. 
Uh, it also eliminates the ability to, um, you know, uh, uh, go to YouTube for that matter. So those work at home, those BYODs or work at home devices, I think need to be locked down. Uh, if the organization isn't deploying their own devices, uh, which they probably should, it would be in their best interest to spend a grand on a laptop or a desktop and a monitor uh, and, and that device itself be locked down in the only way that the information can be accessed uh, on the corporate network is with that lockdown device. Look, at, if you are a financial advisor, you really can't do much uh, with your clients in regards to ex the exchange of uh, client funds, uh, the exchange of communications. If you work within a bank, a financial institution, it's very difficult for you to do anything on your uh, mobile device, on your laptop or desktop, uh, mobile phone, without oversight. Uh, it's, it's pretty tight. The MDM that's deployed through, say, a Merrill Lynch or, uh, or, or Fidelity makes it very difficult for these uh, financial advisors, financial professionals, wealth managers to um, you know, make mistakes, right? So the organization protects that individual from themselves uh, and from making any mistakes. And I would say that no matter what the nature of your business is, if in any way, shape, or form you're engaging in sensitive data, personal information, proprietary information, uh, anything that could uh, uh, get the organization in trouble in any way, shape, or form, ransomware, uh, proprietary secrets, uh, then there should be a, uh, uh, an uncomfortable in regard to next steps, what investments need to be made and to make sure that that employee uh, does not make the mistakes that they easily could if, they're, if their kids are gaming or downloading pirated software or, you know, on BitTorrent, uh, downloading, you know, uh, hacked movies. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely a concern. Uh, one other thing that you mentioned um uh, recently, it is that the some of the privacy concerns around COVID nineteen and the collection of data. Um, you know, I think there's always been a fine line between in data collection and and you know, I guess benefit to the you know consumer, or the users, or you know, being used by the companies. Uh, what's your take on it, and how how can the like, companies kind of protect themselves and or you know, individuals protect themselves from from that data collection? And where do you think that line uh, should be set? Yeah, you, you mean like like contact tracing? And yep. Such like that? Yep. Exactly. So, okay, there's a fine line between security and privacy, right? Uh, and I am of the mindset that I am okay giving up a certain level of privacy for a little more security. I, I've always been uh, in that regard. Like, for example, I have I have wireless cameras that I know ADT monitors. Okay, uh, whether or not there's somebody at ADT watching my cameras. My guess is they can. I mean, I know they can. Uh, that said, I, I prefer to have the cameras than not have the cameras, right? There's no cameras in the kids' bedrooms. There's no cameras in my bedroom. All that being said, I'm okay to give up a little bit of privacy for that opportunity to be able to remotely monitor my home. And, yeah, I could uh, – and I, and I also do have uh, systems where, you know, um, they're isolated from anybody but me and everything's under a VPN and so forth. Uh, that said um, – you know, Google, Apple, um, they uh, all have their flaws. Uh, they have all of our best interests in mind in regards to the contact tracing. Will there be some uh, risk by putting information out there? Absolutely. How will that ultimately affect the quality of your life? How will that ultimately blow back on you in such a way that could potentially affect your ability to be insured, health insurance. How might it affect um, your ability to get a job or your reputation? Uh, how might it affect your ability to um, uh, feel uh, safe or secure or private in your own home? Uh, what, what, kind, what kind of blowback could there be? You know, I've, I've read enough sci-fi and seen enough things happen in real life that I know um, there could very well be blowback. How big of a problem might it be? Well, you've got organizations like EFF and others where there's some level of checks and balances. You have all your watchdogs that look at all of these various uh, systems in place and how and, and what can go possibly wrong. And these organizations, while they are for profit, 
I think in the end, you know, they also want to make sure that their employees are, are safe from COVID, right? That their families are safe from COVID. Uh, will there be some greedy people that might use, use and abuse that information like Cambridge Analytica did? Absolutely. But will that type of information be used in such a way that Cambridge Analytica did? I don't think so, right? You would hope not, right? Um, so uh, there is definitely a, a, a give and take. Am I going to give my name, address, phone number, and social security number um, for instant credit for 10% off of a shoe store? No. Uh, but might I give some basic information uh, for contact tracing? Yeah, I, I feel okay about that. You know, uh, I, I want this thing to go away, and we may, we, we may never actually have a, um, a cure for it. You know, there, there isn't a cure for the common cold. There isn't a cure for AIDS. You know, so I'd like to see th there be a cure for this one. Uh, it killed, what, 40% of the people uh, in, 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 in old age homes, uh, senior centers. And, you know, my mom, my dad, my mother-in-law, you know, they, they're in that, that you know, demographic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, we've seen after September 11, there were a lot of, like, um, regulatory and, you know, things that were put in place uh, right after September 11 that were never actually taken off. Do you see... Uh, you know, some measures are being going to be put in place right now, you know, due to the COVID-19 that will stay even after uh, we're going to pass through it? Yeah, well, after 9-11, there was the Patriot Act, you know, and um, uh, there was some good and some bad that came out of that, right? Um, there's all additional levels of authentication as a result of the Patriot Act, uh, which is a good thing, actually. Um, I, you know, I honestly... I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. Uh, I, th th there's going to be some give and take. There's going to be some negatives, but I think overall they, there'll be some positives. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads me to the, to the next question. So what, um, you know, I try to keep like, you know, end these in positive notes, you know, since we're, we're um, you know, there's all kinds of things going on. And, if, you know, I stopped watching the news because it's just like, you know, it's like more of the same. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always mentioned that, you know, there are some positive aspects of, of what's happening uh, due to the pandemic is uh, um, collaboration on the healthcare side. Um, you know, there seems to be some countries helping each other and so on and seem to be solidarity. Right. I think I've, I've heard from people that they walk down the street and people say hi to each other again. Right. Uh, from your perspective, like and maybe you can do like just some personal note or just, you know, related to what you do. What are some of the you know positive aspects uh, that what you've seen so far, aside from having more time to catch up with some readings? You mean regarding COVID nineteen yeah. as a whole? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want another person to die. But um, uh, that said, the, our the, the entire world needed to chill the hell out. You know, we really needed to like just chill out and and take a step back. Most people I talk to, they have not slept this good in in, in their entire life. Um, most people that I talk to um, have not had as much bonding with their family in their entire lives. Um, most people that I'm talking to are getting more done in and around their home and their ability to work from home uh, has increased exp exponentially. Uh, obviously, there has been the positive effects in the environment. So I, I think there has been a lot of good that has come out of this. Uh, I, I do think it has required us to, to look deeper at everything and make smarter, better decisions. So, you know, uh, not you know, I've heard and there's something going on around in social that you know we're all on we're all on the same boat. Well, we're not all on the same boat. We're all in the same storm, you know. And everybody's boat's a little bit different. Yours might be rocking a little bit more than mine, and this and that. We are all in the same storm, and not everybody's handling it the same way. Um, I, I am a security professional, and so I've been preparing for this my entire adult life you know if, and any of you watching if you didn't have enough toilet paper up till COVID-19 and you scramble the toilet paper shame on you you know and honestly I don't even know how you can consider yourself a security professional if you didn't have enough toilet paper or food or water or a backup generator you know like th this is all stuff that you should be thinking of if you fail to plan you plan to feel and that goes with everything you know medicine everything right and so uh, I, I think that the the introspective aspect of the entire covid-19 is a really good thing for humanity in general i still think we we are destroying the planet uh, we may never recover from it 
But I think, you know, we have certainly um, done a, a really good job of looking at ourselves. I, I mean, I know the relationship with my wife is a lot better. She's a lot calmer. She doesn't have to drive 45 minutes to, to the kids to school every day. And I'm, and I'm, I'm loving the fact that the kids can um, do homeschooling. You know, it's, 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 it's more time together. So, uh, and I think as far as security goes, I, I think that this is a, a, an opportunity for all the small, medium businesses to take a, a hard look at their expenses and how, and I've seen that as much as 70%, and this is a stat you might be able to research, as much as 70% of businesses, you know, since COVID-19 are making more investments in security as a result of this, which I think is a really good thing. I think security in and of itself is becoming more consumable, both for consumers and uh, small to medium businesses, which is which is a really good thing. It it it, it is in some level passing the grandmother test uh, in many aspects. <laughs> That's good. Uh, that and uh, as you mentioned, I think that uh, garages across America are getting uh, organized. You know, this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Robert has been a real pleasure. Um, you know, where can people find you? I mean, I'm going to share some of the contact information for you. And you, you publish uh, five five books, right? So um, what maybe we can do is can share those links afterwards. But where can people find you? What's uh, what's your website? So I am uh, at um, uh, safr.me. So safer, safr.me. So safer me. Uh, and I'm also at protectnowllc.com. So protectnowllc.com. Or just Google Robert Siciliano. If you Google Robert Siciliano, you will find me. I yeah, own you, the you, you've been you've been on uh, you know since uh, 2006, right? Is that what you mentioned? 2000. I've been online since '94. Oh. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So the whole, the whole Led Zeppelin thing did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, once we go back to normal and we do these physical events in New York City, I invite you over to do like a physical, uh, you know, session, and then maybe we can start then in, in the story of uh, you know how how he came to own LedZeppelin.com and what was the story behind that, and then maybe I'll even play some some songs in the background to uh, to to tag it up, you know. So. Uh, <laughs> best yeah absolutely i could i concur thank you very much it's I love been you. a real pleasure thanks for everybody for uh you know for joining this session and uh looking forward to uh you know to uh potentially see, uh, seeing you in new york in, in person